Sometimes I have to take a little bit of my own advice. The things that I'm teaching here on Fearless, I have to put in practice in my own life with my own family. And on this episode, I'm going to share a little bit of a fun and exciting story that happened in my life and how God answered a sweet prayer. Hi, I'm Sissy Graham Lynch. Welcome to Fearless, helping you have a fearless faith in a compromising culture. Hello there, and welcome to Fearless. If you are new, I'm so glad you've joined me here today. And if you would like to get caught up on previous episodes where we have covered a wide range of subjects here on Fearless, you can go to my website, sissygramlynch.com, and of course, anywhere else you listen to podcasts, you can find it. I'd also like to ask you to please subscribe. And also, as a reminder, My Fearless Family devotional is out, so if you would like to join me on a 14-day devotional, you can check out my show notes of where you can order it or download a PDF. And let me just clarify, it's not a devotional for the entire family. It's for you as a parent, as you are raising your family during these crazy, chaotic times that we are facing. We all say that time flies. We always wonder where all the time goes. You know, Christmas came and went so fast. And then you get to January, and January seems to be the slowest month of the year. I saw all these memes that, you know, we're in January 47th. It just never ends. So we're finally into the month of February. As January did creep by, I think for all of us, it was such a great month for me. And I wanted to go back just to share a few things that personally happened in the last five weeks. I did struggle. I had this weird illness that lasted five weeks, all the way from Christmas to about a week ago. I know what y'all are all thinking when you hear me say that. No, it's not COVID. My coworker, as I'm saying that right now, is grabbing his hand sanitizer. Wasn't COVID. I got checked so many times, got checked for pneumonia, everything under the sun. Couldn't figure out what it was. It was just this cold that stuck around. Recently, if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I was just in Washington, D.C. for the 49th annual March for Life. I've shared a little bit in the past of my story with the March for Life. I went for the first time a couple years ago. It was an event that forever impacted and changed my life. And I don't say that lightly because I don't say that about too many things. And it really did because I realized when I was there, I have been pro-life my entire life or in my adult life, I've been pro-life. And I realized I was a person that voted pro-life. I would say I was pro-life, but that's where my action would end. And I had sat silent and on the sidelines my entire life. So when I went a couple years ago, it changed my life. I went to the March for Life. And also the following day, they have a pro-life summit for high school and college students, which is incredible. And I want to share a lot more detail on that in a few weeks on another episode of Fearless, because we are going to talk about the Supreme Court case that is coming up. In June, well, the case has already been heard about from the Supreme Court, but we will hear the decision in June. And a lot of people have heard Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned. So I will explain a little more of that in an upcoming episode. But for this, the 49th annual March for Life, of course, they are hoping this is the last one before we are post Roe America. Let me tell you, it was so cold. I live in Florida. I grew up in the mountains, but now that I've lived in Florida, maybe my blood has thinned out because the high was about 29 degrees. And I was praying at the March for Life. We were out there for hours beforehand. But it is amazing to see how many people will come out. And that's where the impact for me that I saw people have come out in the past in the rain, the snow, the freezing cold, because they were fighting for life. They're fighting for an issue that they truly believe in that has been an injustice here in America on the most vulnerable in our society, and they have fought for it for 49 years. I met this one guy. I'd seen him up there at the Supreme Court a couple of times on other pro-life events, and he carries the same sign. And I went up to introduce myself to him, and he says he's been coming for over 40 years for every pro-life event. And he said many of his friends have passed away, but he still gets up early morning, drives from the coast of Maryland just to come to D.C., to fight for life. And he said, I hope I pass this on to the next generation. And I truly believe in his time that he will see this overturn. So I'm so thankful for his faithfulness of over 40 years of advocating for life. 
You know, I did wake up sad a little bit the morning after because I think one thing I've taken away from my couple experiences at the March for Life, it is mostly Catholics. They have spearheaded this this movement. They are the ones that have really actively advocated for life, especially up in Washington and in our culture. And don't make it wrong, there's so many wonderful Christian agencies, churches who support moms and pregnancy centers in their own communities. But for those marching, I mean, it's Catholic schools up there and Catholic students, all the young people, they're there with their Catholic high school. And I'm so thankful for them teaching that younger generation that I want Protestants to step up. And so that's kind of my goal this next year is to get a lot more Protestant youth pastors and schools to send kids up there to D.C. But I was just encouraged, encouraged leaving, seeing how our culture is shifting, not just to make abortion illegal, but there is a generation rising up that is making abortion unthinkable. They're doing it with grace. This is a younger generation that's doing it, of course, with truth. They got science on their side. They're rising up and saying, we're not going to take it anymore. And these are high school students and college students that they're probably more liberal on other social issues, but they'll cross the line when it comes to abortion. And it's like they're standing up before the world and saying, no more, not on our watch. It was just an incredible experience. Like I said, we are going to explain a little bit more of what this post-Roe America will look like, what's at stake at the Supreme Court come this June, because I want everybody to have a better understanding. But also today, I want to share something else that happened in January, and I kind of debated back and forth whether I should share it. It's a praise report for me, so I do want to share it with you all, because when we started off this year, in the very first episode of this year, I explained to you what my heart was, what my heart was for my children, my focus on really raising a family that is fearless in this changing culture and raising kids who love Jesus in a culture that is hostile to him. And so when it was December 31st and as the new year was approaching, I was talking on the phone to a friend and she was, what is your reading plan for the next year? I said, a reading plan? I I don't know. I don't have a reading plan. Am I supposed to have a Bible reading plan? The answer is yes. We should probably always have a plan because we're more diligent with our time. But I was behind. I did not have a reading plan. And I had mentioned in a couple episodes ago at the beginning of the year that prayer was going to be the theme for my family this year and how I wanted to be more intentional with my prayer life. But let me give you a little bit of backstory of that. You know, and as I was sharing, this was New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve happens to be my wedding anniversary. I've been married 14 years, but out of the 14 years, we've only been together two. Because for the first, like, seven years we were married, he was still in the NFL. So he often had practice or away games. And then when he was done with the NFL, my dad does a annual hunting trip with all the boys. So my brothers and, of course, my husband, Corey. And what am I going to tell my husband? Don't go on a hunting trip with my family. So he's gone on a hunting trip. So it was New Year's Eve. I was lying in bed and I was just praying because I said, Lord, what should my theme be? What should I be focusing on spiritually this year? In the past, of course, I don't do New Year's resolutions, but God has given me words to focus on. And this year it was so clearly while I was in bed getting ready to go to sleep He just said prayer, praying for my kids and to be more intentional. And that's, of course, what I shared with you earlier. In the past, when he's given me words, there have been a couple of years where it's been so clear the words he's given me and how I've seen that play out. So this year on December 31st, he said prayer, prayer for your children, be more intentional with them. And it was January 3rd and we were driving to school and I turned the radio down I was kind of practicing what I preach to all of you here on Fearless and how I've often said our car rides are our greatest mission field. Well, I was going to make the most of this opportunity on the way to school because with my busy schedule of traveling and stuff, I don't always get to take them to school. I started talking to my son, asking him, and he's in kindergarten, by the way, and he's a typical boy, kind of short answers. My little girl who's eight gives all the long answers and everything you need to know. I said, Austin, what are you learning in school about the Bible? And um, I can't remember exactly what he said. And I said, what about sin? Have you learned about sin? And he goes, yes, ma'am. And what is sin? And we went into explaining what is sin. And he says, so I can never go to heaven because I've sinned. And I said, no, awesome, because what's the good news? What did Jesus do on the cross for you and me? 
for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus, he died on the cross for you and for me, that if you believe in him, that you ask God to forgive you for your sins, that you can go to heaven. And it's that easy. And then he, you know, he's thinking and he goes, well, mom, have I ever asked God to forgive me? And I said, no, you haven't, buddy. I said, but would you like to? And he said, yes, ma'am, I want to. My little girl, she's eight and she is quite the different personality. You know, she's kind of a people pleaser. I think even in her prayers, she'll try to say the most perfect prayer, trying to please me. It's funny because she looked at her brother and said, Austin, I haven't even asked God to forgive me. So I asked, I said, Margaret, would you like to? And she said, nope. And in that moment, I was kind of proud of her for saying no, to be honest. Of course, I want my little girl to ask God to forgive her and ask Jesus into her life. But I want that to be on her own time, not something I've pushed on her. I know God's got an anointed moment for her. I don't know if that's two years down the road or 20 years down the road. I have no idea, but I will pray faithfully for that moment. But I'm so thankful that she hasn't done it just trying to please me because she is a people pleaser. So in the car, my little son in kindergarten on the first week of 2022, asked God to forgive him and asked Jesus into his life. And it was the sweetest moment. God had whispered that to me on December 31st, just a few days before. And it was like God was just affirming, you know, to me as a parent to be faithful in what he's called me to do and to raising my children and investing in their spiritual development, that he has them in his hand and he's going to take care of them. You know, I hear the debate often about child salvation, and I've never pushed it on my children. My mom reminded me after I shared this story with her that I asked Jesus into my life five times when I was a kid. My husband asked God to forgive him when he was five years old, and he remembers it so clearly. And another friend shared the same thing. But I had a friend share a quote from Greg Laurie, because when his son asked Jesus into his life at a young age, he was kind of struggling with the same thing. How can he really understand? He doesn't really know what he's asking or praying for. And Greg Laurie said, your son has given all he knows about himself at five years old to all he knows about Jesus. And we do that whether we're five or if we're 45. We surrender all we know about ourselves to all we know about Jesus. And a couple of months ago, I picked up a book a friend had given me actually quite a few years ago, and I'd put it aside, but it's called Praying Scriptures Over Your Children. And it was around November because I was convicted that my prayers weren't intentional. And it's kind of more of that simple prayer, Lord, take care of our children, help them to have a good night's sleep, help them to do well in school. Nothing wrong with those prayers. And another friend who I'm doing a Bible study with, she says, I really don't know how to pray over my children. So I've picked up this book for the two of us, and I began to read it over in November of just how we can be intentional, what we can specifically pray for our children, and insert their names in Scripture. And I do that for myself all the time, but I don't know why I haven't done it for my children. Maybe it's out of like laziness and you just start praying. So praying specific scriptures. And the first chapter of the book is praying for your child's salvation. And one of the stories that she shared in this book hit me, reminding us that our children are on our own. They are a gift from the Lord. And there was this one parent that was sharing the story that her one prayer since her kids were little was, Lord, let them live long enough that they can accept you as their Lord and Savior. I can't remember the specifics, but it was around like eight or 10 years old. Her son was diagnosed with a disease, and they later found out that he wasn't supposed to live past seven. But right before he was diagnosed, he had asked the Lord to be the Lord of his life. And then when he was diagnosed two months after that, she realized how sweet answer to prayer the Lord had done, that her son had lived three more years and was able to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. So this book has been, just as I've been reading it in the last couple months here and there, just really impactful. And I'll share that in my show notes because I think it's a great, maybe a gift for a young parent that you might know or even a parent that has kids in middle school and even for grandparents and how we can pray for your children and grandchildren and a good gift to give those around you. Because see, I'm definitely a product of a power of a praying mom. I know so many of you are too. My mom has spent countless sleepless nights praying for my brothers and praying for me and now praying for her grandchildren and how thankful I am 
for a praying mom. And I know my dad would say the same thing. I remember asking my dad one time, what did he miss most about my grandmother? And he said, I miss her prayers. I knew she was always praying over me. When I think of my grandmother, to this day, I wish I could sit by her bed or her chair and ask her questions because when she was still alive, I wasn't even engaged yet. So I hadn't lived like these hard chapters of life yet of marriage and raising children. So I learned through her from her writings to this day. I was just up a couple hours ago at my desk reading some of her writing and I'll go on YouTube. And one of my favorite videos that she has She's talking about raising children. She talks about raising a prodigal son. It would have been my dad. She said, we as parents, when we're talking about the salvation of our children, we are to take care of the possible and God takes care of the impossible. That salvation is a miracle. It's a miracle of the heart. And as parents, we're not in the miracle business. Only God is in that. So he is to take care of the impossible. But what we as parents can take care of is discipling them, growing them up in God's word, pointing them to God's truth during the trials of life and living a life that would reflect God in our home. And one of the verses in my devotional Fearless Family that I focus on on one of the days is 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And I think while we usually think about friends or our coworkers, when we think about this verse and evangelism and sharing the hope of Christ that we have and to always be able to give an answer to the world when they come to us. But this command applies directly to our relationship with our children. And as parents, we, of course, have the high calling to teach our children about Jesus and to show them how to share their faith with others. Of course, while it's easy to take this opportunity for granted, it's important that we don't leave this responsibility up to others, like the church and the school. We've talked about that here before on Fearless, that the times are changing. The church is changing on theology a lot, that we have to be intentional with our own time with our children. And a couple important things to know about this verse is, first, we must think about what is implied that we should be living a life that causes someone to ask us about it, that it should be so different. And I just had this conversation with my children at the dinner table last night. I played this song called Joyful to my children, and I told them I'm going to start playing this at nighttime and in the morning. And it's kind of a new take on I Got Joy Joy Down in My Heart, a, a modern twist to it. And it's fun. And I was told them, I said, Austin, you should have so much joy in your life that we as a family have this inner joy that only comes from Jesus, that people should think we're different, that we live different. And so I think that first, that's what we should imply when we look at this verse. We should be living a life that causes someone to ask us about it. Secondly, we're charged to always be prepared. And that means that we have to study God's word faithfully. It's our duty to know what the Bible says in order to be able to speak with authority when asked. And yes, that's even with our children. And sometimes they can ask the toughest questions. My little girl who's eight is now asking questions that I never even thought of asking when I was little. And I've had to be honest with her, like, "Mm, I might not know that answer and I have to get back to you. But it's also sweet how the Holy Spirit will meet you right there in the moment and give you some creative answer to speak on their level that they can understand. And as parents, we spend a lot of time in the car with our kids driving to and from school and church and sports activities. And I've told you, my mom used our car time together to talk about the difficult subjects of life. And we know in the times that we're facing, our children have lots of difficult subjects. Of course, that was a sweet time for my family as I just shared the car rides The times that we put our children to bed, I know when I put my little girl to bed, I am so tired at night. I just want to put her to bed, close the door. And I've realized how much she opens up at nighttime. I know that's the case for most parents, that their children will just become little chatterboxes and tell you everything right before bed. And those are the sweet moments to have those sweet conversations. And God will use those sweet moments to work in their lives. They might seem very small and simple to you, but they are going to have a huge impact on your kids, those moments you have those conversations to build that relationship with them. And if your children have already made a decision to follow Jesus, take the time to equip them to stand for him and teach them how to share his faith. We just had a podcast with Jay Warner Wallace, where he gives us great ideas, great conversations on how to have these conversations with our children. So if you missed that, I encourage you to go check it out and check out some of his resources. 
and his books on how to have these conversations with our kids. And I want to encourage you to keep praying for your children, no matter what age they are. We know we always need the power of a praying mama and of the power of a praying dad, of course, and grandparents and aunts and uncles. That it is so important that we are intentional with our time to evangelize to our children. Our children need to hear the hope of Jesus and to be intentional with those times. It was just like that sweet morning with my car ride with Austin. I turned the radio off and just asked him directly about the gospel, about sin. Had he ever asked God into his heart or into his life? And he said, no. I said, but would you like to? And my dad shared that with me one time because Margaret one time was asking all these questions and then she just kind of ended it there. And I didn't know how to bridge because I didn't want to push her. And my dad said, sissy, just be direct with her. Ask her if she wants to. And that's when I did. And she told me no. And Austin said yes. And I was so thankful because I will be praying for that moment that God has appointed for her and that her faith will be real for her, not her mama's faith, not her daddy's faith, and not her granddaddy's faith, but it will be real to her in that moment. But I wanted to take today to share my story of kind of what the last month is and my praise report. I had hesitated about sharing it with you, but I talk so much about here raising children and being intentional, and I had to really practice what I preached It was sweet in that moment. I know God doesn't always answer our prayers that fast. And I don't know what Austin's little life is going to hold one day, but I will hold on to the sweet promises that God does answer our prayers. His ear is inclined to us, as Scripture says. So if you're a parent that has been praying for your children for two years, or if you've been praying for your children for 20 years, and God has not answered, do not give up. He is faithful. His ear is inclined to you, and he's listening, and he's got a time he's not done with your child yet. He's working in their lives. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Fearless. And if you would like to check out the 14-day devotional that I have written based on 1 Peter, helping you to have a fearless family and raising kids who love Jesus in a culture that is hostile towards him, you can check out the show notes. There's a PDF version, or you can order a hard copy. Yes, I'm a millennial. I still like hard copies of everything because I like to highlight and take notes. That is an option for you as well. Check out my website, sissygramlynch.com, if you want to catch up on previous episodes and follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and also subscribe to the podcast if you're wanting the latest episodes as they are released. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Fearless, helping you have a fearless faith and a compromising culture. Fearless.